I have a plan. I don't want to broadcast to the enemy exactly what my but plan is. And let me tell you, if I like maybe a combination of my plan and the general's plan, or the general's plan, if I like their plan, Matt, I'm not going to call you up and say, Matt, we have a great plan. Big surprise, Trump voters. He had no plan. And he doesn't think his generals have a plan either. Tonight, NBC News reports exclusively that President Donald Trump, quote, has become increasingly frustrated with his advisors tasked with crafting a new U.S. strategy in Afghanistan and recently suggested firing the war's top military commander during a tense meeting at the White House, according to senior administration officials. At one point, the president directed his frustration at Defense Secretary James Mattis, saying he had given the military authority months ago to make advances in Afghanistan, and yet the U.S. was continuing to lose ground. The president's advisors went into the mid-July meeting hoping he would sign off on an Afghanistan strategy after months of delays, officials said. Trump compared the policy review process to the renovation of a famed New York restaurant in the 1980s. Trump told his advisors that the restaurant, Manhattan's Elite 21 Club, had shut its doors for a year and hired an expensive consultant to craft a plan for a renovation. After a year, Trump said the consultant's only suggestion was that the restaurant needed a bigger kitchen. Officials said Trump kept stressing the idea that lousy advice cost the owner a year of lost business and that Talking to the restaurant's waiters instead might have yielded a better result. He also said the tendency is to assume if someone isn't a three-star general, he doesn't know what he's talking about, and that, in his own experience in, in business, talking to low-ranking workers has gotten him better outcome. Joining us now, people who know Donald Trump, Tim O'Brien, executive editor of Bloomberg View and the author of Trump Nation, The Art of Being the Donald. Also with us, David K. Johnston, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist, who founded DCReport.org, a nonprofit news organization that covers the Trump administration. You are, have both written books about Donald Trump. And Tim O'Brien, I want to go to you first on this matter of his frustration with the generals. Uh, here he lied his way through the campaign saying, I have a secret plan, you know, don't worry about it. And then I'll listen to the general's plan and if I like their plan better. And it turns out he had no plan. The generals have a plan that he doesn't like because it didn't work in, what, uh, a week or two. And, and because he can recall this long ago incident at a local restaurant, at a restaurant. in New York yes. that gave him all of the experience and authority he needed to have to weigh in on military policy. We don't even know if the anecdote about the 21 Club is true. That's the other well, thing. Well, what we know is that the 21 Club wasn't closed as long as they said, and, and yeah. that, so he exaggerates all the parts of that story, yes, too. Yes, right. Yeah. To, to make his point, which is that he should, be, he should be listening to troops on the ground in Afghanistan rather than the military brass, and that that gives him the authority to go after Nicholson and to question Nicholson's leadership in Afghanistan and to apparently take Mattis to task in front of the Joint Chiefs and, and, and again shows him out of his depth uh, without a clear plan of his own and sort of grasping for straws of his own past to say, I have the authority to weigh in here. And uh, David, of course, uh, Donald Trump got some great ideas from all the troops in Afghanistan when he visited there. Oh, but wait. I'm sorry. He's never been to Afghanistan. He's never talked to anyone who has served right. in Afghanistan. And of course, uh, he didn't talk to the waiters at the 21 Club either. We know that. Right. And, and Donald has no idea about what's actually going on in Afghanistan, about the cultural differences in that country that go back hundreds of years. Uh, that we've interfered in. What we do know is Donald has said, oh, hey, they've got a lot of mineral wealth, and like the oil in Iraq, he thinks we should grab it, which isn't surprising since Donald has spent a lot of his life cheating people out of their property. Why would he not think the same thing about Afghanistan? And this is just an absolute farce. Uh, Tim, th there's a, a passage in here in the NBC reporting about Donald Trump's kind of wild dissatisfaction with generals. These are his, this week is the week where we're seeing all of his public worship of generals and he hires a general to be his White House chief of staff. It turns out uh, he's got uh, a limited amount of respect <clears throat> going in their direction too. And so if he's turning on them, uh, you know, how long before General Kelly discovers that Donald Trump doesn't think his judgment is so great. Possibly minutes. I, I think, the, you know, the issue here is that he acts and thinks episodically. And the main thing driving, I think, uh, his lashing out on Afghanistan is 
He said he would figure it out. He said he would go in there and solve a problem no one else can solve. And now I think we've been in Afghanistan for 16 years. It's, it's traveled as an issue across two administrations. And he's not going to find it any easier to solve than his predecessors. And so the first thing he'll do is say, the reason I can't solve it is because I have bad generals. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, David, that was kind of the, the, the essence of the Trump critique over the course of the campaign is uh, the Obama administration uses bad generals. I'm going to use the good generals. I can't give you any of their names because I don't actually know any. But the, he has General Kelly. He has John Kelly sitting there basically right outside of his office all day. The White House chief of staff, who is a general, at some point, if not already, he's turning to him and saying, what do we do in Afghanistan? And if General Kelly is saying the same thing he's hearing from the other generals, uh, how long does Donald Trump rely on General Kelly? Yeah, I, I think it'll be very interesting to see how long General Kelly lasts. But uh, let's keep in mind, Lawrence, those are our generals. They're not Donald's generals. And Donald is our employee who we put in there through the Electoral College. Uh, Donald continues in all of this to act like, you know, he's this dictator. And if you're not doing what he wants, off with your head. And uh, Tim, uh, talk about where Donald Trump had to get uh, in, in his fear of what was coming, to the point where he gets rid of Reince Priebus, he brings in a new White House chief of staff, who he doesn't know, who, who he, he never knew during the campaign. Uh, this is uh, not anything like what we've seen him do before. He doesn't necessarily feel he can dominate him. That's uncharacteristic of Trump. Uh, and here he has this new regime in the White House where, uh, you know, John Kelly is basically putting out the word publicly uh, through the press secretary, yes, the president's daughter and his son-in-law can only speak to him if they go through me. What would Donald Trump have to have gotten to to accept that as the public view of his White House? Uh, a, a, a raging concern that his, his image and reputation were at stake because of the momentary crazy around Scaramucci and his call to Ryan Liz and everything in the fallout around that. But I would, I, I, again, I don't think this is going to last. Uh, Ivanka Trump tweeted yesterday that she's, she's looking forward to serving alongside uh, Kelly. She didn't say <laughs> reporting into him. And, yeah. and, Tim, and I agree with and Tim. He said, yeah. and you know, and he said tonight, uh, or it was reported tonight, that uh, Sessions is safe now because Kelly says he's safe. I don't think that will last for a second. If Donald Trump wants to get rid of Sessions, he'll continue to pursue it. David, uh, one of the other, uh, Michael D'Antonio, one of the other Trump biographers, has written a, a fascinating piece saying uh, that he believes for Donald Trump to get to this point, uh, he had to believe that the entire administration was on the brink of disaster, the sinking poll numbers, the failure of the health care bill, uh, the crazy outburst from Scaramucci and all of that, that he had to be uh, in a state of, of real fear in order to make a move that's so uncharacteristic of bringing someone in who he doesn't know and cannot necessarily control. He, and, and I think that's exactly right. I think Michael's right about that. The, the, but Donald's fear and his inner recognition that he doesn't know what he's doing here and these virtually delusional statements where Donald just makes things up and creates his own reality, phone calls from Boy Scouts and Mexico, Mexican presidents and the like, all of those are still brewing inside him. Just because we're not seeing his crazy Twitter storms doesn't mean anything has changed about who he is. And at some point, you know, a tea kettle that is stopped up will explode. We're going to see something happen in the near future. And uh, this is not a stable environment. And it can't be as long as Donald Trump is in the White House. Uh, Tim, it's such an interesting point that David just made. And, and you guys have both written books about Donald Trump, uh, studied him closely. So let's just assume that General Kelly has contained him on Twitter, no ins utterly, provably insane tweets. Uh, there's, there is an insanity in him that we have seen come out through Twitter. If the general is bottling all that up, at what point and how does it manifest itself? You know, I, I think one of the key things why, why he's been a survivor for decades and why he plows ahead in these kinds of situations is he creates his own realities. He's very good at saying, if the fact pattern out in the real world collides with my sense of myself, I'll just make up a new story. I'll invent a fable to allow me to say they're wrong and I'm right. I think, I think he can continue on that path a lot longer than most of his observers can probably stomach watching it. Uh, David, quickly before we go, is this like Donald Trump?
Trump on the verge of bankruptcy and how he behaves with bank officials when he's trying to get them to just relax and give them a little bit of a break on the loan. He's a really, he goes in there and, he, and he's a really good boy uh, talking to those bank officials. That's the way he is with uh, John Actually, Kelly the, right the now. The bankers. Yeah, the bankers and the bank lawyers banned him from the room. They didn't want him there. What he did in that case was he got allies, the politicians and the New Jersey state government, to take his side against his bankers. Here, he has ticked off and, and sent away the people who could be his allies. Mitch McConnell, the Republicans, many of them on, on Capitol Hill. And he doesn't have these allies to do this. That's part of the problem. I don't know how he get, digs himself out of this. Tim O'Brien and David K. Johnson, thank you both for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.